Uh, so I'm going to tell you a story. Um, it, some of the names have been changed to protect the innocent, but it is a fantastic example of um, snatching uh, defeat from the jaws of victory. And I'm also going to talk about a slab cake. Uh, I am going to take a hostage if I have to read one more article that starts with, change is the only constant. Of course, change is the only constant. My question is, if it's the only constant, why do we suck so badly at it as organizations? 80% of organizational change fails to deliver the promises that it was supposed to deliver, and I'm going to lay the blame at the feet, mostly of communication, and I'm going to tell you a story about how I personally screwed that up. Um, early in my career, I was a reporter, and one of the very first uh, stories I covered was New Coke. Is anybody here old enough to remember New Coke? Yeah, so that's where Coke said, we're going to change the flavor of our product, throw it out there in the market, and see how people like it. Problem is, they forgot to ask their customers if that was cool. Two years, millions of dollars, and a whole lot of embarrassment later, New Coke was quietly sent away to the corner, Old Coke came back, and nobody, nobody apparently is, is more damaged. Uh, Daimler and Chrysler merged and managed to tank both brands epically. Why? They forgot to ask the employees how maybe they could put the cultures together to build a better company. The uh, AOL Time Warner merger was so epically bad, it spawned not one but two best-selling business books. And who went out and redeemed their air miles for a sous vide machine they didn't especially want because they thought they were going to go away? Air miles forgot to check with the rest of us. So communication is really at the heart of getting your change right. So I'm going to tell you a story about a company I worked for. It was a software company. We made mission-critical um, enterprise software for the public sector. So our clients needed us 24-7. Clients all over the world, an excellent company, had excellent products. The product was getting a bit old. So our president sent out that email, you know, with the Tiger team that was going to fix the product, and they spent two years fixing the product, all new platform. It was fantastic. And I get the phone call, and he's like, Elizabeth, we want to launch this thing in our fiscal year. Really go out with a bang. I'm like, awesome, I ordered a slab cake. And then I went, like, sorry, our fiscal year ends in two weeks. And he's like, yeah, just do your best. So my first lesson about change management, it always takes longer than two weeks. I'm sorry, I don't care what you're doing. You can't install a new water fountain and announce it properly in less than two weeks. I think it actually takes about two months. But I did it. And so I wrote things and I sent them off to translation and against all odds, you know, 10 days into my two week window, things were looking pretty good to roll this sucker out. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, for starters, there was this vice president who was away. And she had some opinions, because they do. And so she came back, and she's like, oh, no, I need this change and this change and this change. They weren't actually significant changes. But what I learned was to beware of the faboodle. That is the fear of being left out of the loop on the part of senior executives in your organization. They don't like that. When they come back from wherever they were, when the thing was going around and the decisions were being made, that will come back and bite you every single time. That's one of the reasons things take longer than two weeks. So, all right, so we pulled everything back out of translation. We were translating into about 12 languages because we did business all over the world. Pull it all out of translation, make her little changes, put it back into translation. Away we go, slab cake still on order. What else could possibly go wrong? Well, the day came and we sent out the email to all the employees worldwide. Yay, new platform, it's fantastic, fixes all these problems. You know, our customers' input was considered. Yay, team, go team. Remember, keep in mind, the last time people heard about this was two years prior. So there were probably 70% of the employees actually didn't know this project was going on. So it's like, oh. By 10 a.m., we knew something was terribly wrong, and by 11, I was back in the president's office having a conversation about what we were going to do about all the customer support people who were worried they were losing their jobs because we had this new platform and they hadn't been trained. And then in walks the guy from the product development teams that worked on the old product saying, my guys are actually thinking that they're maybe not going to have a job next year because if, you know, if you're getting rid of the old platform, what are they going to work on? By noon, the sales team was calling down its quota for the quarter saying, we can't possibly sell the new thing or the old thing because we got this new thing coming, but we don't know anything about the new thing, so we're not selling anything. Tell me if this sounds familiar. So the lesson I learned in that moment was that it's never, we don't fear change, right? There's this whole sort of thing, oh, people are afraid of change. We're not afraid of change. Our success as a species is due in large part to the fact that we're very adaptable to change. We fear loss. 
So how many of you have done like an office move, a little reorganization? Yeah. More knickers in a knot about moving the desk 10 feet to the left than anything else because we, we fear loss of status, loss of power, loss of income. So some are reasonable fears, some are just I don't want to sit near the bathroom fears. But when we, when we understand what people are afraid of losing, we can get a little better on our communication. So that was the third lesson. And yet we persisted, right? Because it wasn't bad enough. So at noon, out went the email to all of our customers worldwide. Yay, us. And then what happened is they all picked up the phone. And they didn't say, yay, you. They said, what do you mean you're giving me a new platform? That's like a six-month project. I can't do that. I'm doing an SAP implementation. You needed to check with me first. We did check with them, but it was two years ago. And they didn't remember. We got... <laughs> So our phone lines lit up in the customer service department. Our account managers were getting emails and phone calls and texts from, for everybody from, you know, I just bought the old one. How can you switch it up like this? So there's a whole lot of stuff coming in. And many of them were just phoning to ask questions. Does the reporting, is the reporting different? Do I need to hire someone? Do we need to kick off a project? All these things. And guess what our frontline people had to say? Nothing, we hadn't given them any information. It was three hours old as far as they were concerned. And so the lesson I learned there is that it all happens on the front lines. And I think that our earlier speaker talking about the need to train those managers had it right. Your secret weapon in any change, whether it's an internal thing or an external thing, a good thing like a new product or a crummy thing like a downsizing, is your frontline managers. The people who are right face to face, snout to snout, with the people who are losing something or think they're losing something, they're your secret weapon. Arm them with information, make them feel confident about that information, and you can survive any change, even the one that you did in two weeks. And still we went along, because at the end of the day, we sent out the press release. So just after the markets closed in Toronto, they're opening up in Asia. And so we all went home and slept, and while we were sleeping, the media in our industry was busy publishing things about this big company. Remember, we're the number one player in the space. We power more of these municipal organizations than anyone else saying, company X is sunsetting, is sunsetting its flagship product. Sunsetting means you're not supporting it anymore. We weren't. We had never said we were sunsetting it, but we hadn't said we weren't. So I canceled the launch party, took that slab cake home, ate the entire thing by myself. <laughs> And learned lesson number five, which is if you don't connect the dots about your change, someone else will. And in this case, it was the media. So the dots should have formed a pleasing picture of a clown or a dog in a hat. They painted it up to, uh-oh, this big major platform is going away and it's screwing the world's municipalities. That was fun to deal with. And so I will leave you then with the final change lesson, which is the one thing. So if you are that person, because I know HR is often that's the oh yeah, we're, we just bought a company, we're announcing it tomorrow, can you just like help us tell the employees? So if you are that person, if you do nothing else to prepare, identify your stakeholders and define them. If I had sat down and spent 10 minutes thinking about sales and customer service and customers and the media and all that, I probably would have figured out where there were little fear factors I had to be aware of. And it probably would have occurred to me to push back on the timeline and maybe give people a little bit more information than, hey, we're having a party, I ordered a cake. So, and then I will leave you with the best chart ever. This has been stuck above my desk for 15 years, and whenever a change thing comes along, this is my starting point. It's probably hard to see, and if you email me, I will happily send this to you as a PDF. It's by a guy named Noster, and basically he's identified six things that need to exist for change to be successful. So vision, consensus, skills, incentives, resources, and action plan. And this chart very nicely illustrates whenever one of those is absent, what you get. So in the absence, for example, of Consensus, you end up with sabotage. Stop me if you've heard that. So this is a fantastic chart. So if you are the one who's still standing when the music stops, if you get to communicate the change, start here, identify your stakeholders, and push for a little bit more time. Thank you very much. Thank you.